Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marshall Liu. Um, I'm the mental health coordinator for the Hunter College and a PZ project in New York City, and I am one of the national advisors to the Steve Fund. Welcome to Anti-Asian Racism and the Mental Health Crisis on College Campuses. This is a collaborative event uh, co-sponsored by the Steve Fund and the National Center for Institutional Diversity at the University of Michigan. Um, this session will be closed captioned, so this feature is available by clicking on the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen on that below that toolbar. Um, you should select show subtitles there and um, also feel free to submit any questions or comments using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom application as well. There should be a little um, Q&A like with some bubbles there that you can submit comments on. Um, Let's see, your name may be read aloud, so please let us know if you wish to remain anonymous. And um, we wanted to address, as many of you know, this is our second convening uh, after an unfortunate and very upsetting Zoom bombing that occurred last week. Um, we were forced to end the event abruptly, and we were, I know I can speak for myself, was we were quite shaken um, and by this intrusion. And we wanted to acknowledge how this event was traumatic for us as well as for many of our participants. Um, thank you to all of you for the outpouring of support and solidarity. We're truly inspired as we continue this conversation today. Um, we wanna courageously keep pursuing racial equity for students of color and the fight for racial justice is clearly important and meaningful and necessary um, and only underscored by the efforts to stop us. So I am inspired and so proud to be with you today um, as we have this conversation. Uh, the Steve Fund is a national organization dedicated to the mental health and emotional well-being of young people of color, and they work in partnership with leaders in higher education, the corporate sector, and other workplace environments, other nonprofits, and community partners to promote the mental health and the well-being of young people of color. And this event today is open and free to the public and an opportunity to learn and discuss about the various needs of Asian American Pacific Islander or AAPI college students as well as to learn about strategies for better supporting the student community. In the wake of increased anti-Asian violence this last year, including the shooting in Atlanta of six Asian Americans last March, the Steve Fund launched an initiative focusing on Asian American Pacific Islander students. And some of us witnessed some of that anti-Asian racism that we're up against even when we met last week. Also given last year's chaotic and disorienting pandemic, we anticipate a particularly difficult transition for AAPI students as they return in person to college campuses this fall. And as a result, the Steve Fund and the National Center for Institutional Diversity convened eight experts um, in AAPI college mental health to study or to, to identify and study stressors and brainstorm in, uh, recommendations that um, higher education institutions um, could use to, if, if they wanted to better support their AAPI students. Today's event features some of those expert participants from that expert committee, as well as other nationally renowned um, experts in AAPI college mental health. We hope today's presentation discussion helps to build community, clarify some information, but really to generate some like creative advocacy strategies and interventions that you can use for supporting your AAPI students. And also as a heads up in August, we'll be publishing an online resource um, featuring various recommendations for institutions interested in supporting their AAPI students. We hope today's discussion stimulates your own curiosity and creativity um, as you think about your campus environments and how to implement these recommendations in, in your own unique ways. Today's event will run for 90 minutes. We'll go until 1230. And we'll start with a recorded keynote conversation with Dr. Kevin Adal, who will give an overview of various AAPI college student mental health needs. We'll then transition to our live expert panel, uh, focusing on interventions and strategies for increasing support for AAPI students, followed by Q&A. &A. And we invite you to share your thoughts um, in the um, Q&A as, as that comes up throughout, throughout our time. Um, please be aware that today's event is being recorded and it might be shared in full or in part with others who could not make this time today. Okay, so now I'm going to share a little bit of my screen and tell you a little about Kevin. 
So I'd like to first introduce our recorded keynote conversation with Dr. Kevin Nadal. Dr. Nadal is a professor of psychology at John Jay College and the Graduate Center um, at the City University of New York, CUNY. He has written 12 books and over 100 publications, including Microaggressions and Traumatic Stress, Queering Law and Order, and Filipino American Psychology. Um, as one of the leading scholars on microaggression theory and queer psychology, he has been featured on the New York Times, BuzzFeed, ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, the History Channel, and more. Uh, we're so appreciative of Kevin having joined us in person last week, and although he was unable to join us today, we're grateful for this presentation. Um, in it, I'm going to ask him a couple questions, and you'll see, and you'll see how he answers. We also talk a little bit about what happened last week, so let's watch. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, I'm so delighted to be having this conversation today with Dr. Kevin Nadal. He's a professor of psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, as well as at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Um, Kevin, we've been through a Hi. lot. Thank we you have so been. much. Thank you so much for coming back again and speaking with our audience today. I am so thrilled and grateful. Um, I know you and I have been through a lot since last week, and I wanted to acknowledge just how horrifying and troubling that experience was. And I noticed for myself, yeah. I just want to check in with you about it and also just know, and I know it, it took me a couple of days to really understand what had happened. Um, I wanted to see how you were thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that um, it brought up for me is just this whole idea of racial trauma or historical trauma or collective trauma, whatever we want to name it as, um, and that it was, you know, one event that, you know, triggers the accumulation of various traumatic events that we have either collectively experienced, individually experienced, or some combination of all of those things. Um, and so for me, it brought up, you know, overt experiences with racism, it brought up feelings of um, unsafety or um, lack of, uh, you know, control in the world, especially amongst um, racism, systemic racism, and in this case, like over violent racism. Um, and, you know, and I think with any sort of racial trauma, um, it takes time to heal. Um, but like I mentioned on the actual day that all this happened, I really do believe that we are resilient people. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, we get through these things. Um, I wish we didn't have to be so resilient. Um, but I also recognize that we are. And um, I'm glad we're redoing this because, uh, you know, one of the things that was said was shut the F up over and over and over again. And, you know, the lesson is that you can't shut us up. We will continue fighting. We'll continue yelling. We'll continue advocating for justice um, as long as we have our voices, are able to, you know, fight. Um, and here we are continuing that fight. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of this. I know that it, it felt like in the moment I was thinking a lot about like the feeling of shame and how when trauma happens, mm -hmm. especially racial trauma, you feel so responsible. And suddenly it's like, how did I let this happen? Um, and I know mm -hmm. I had to do a lot of work on myself to really recognize like this is terrorism and this is not my fault. And this yep. is white supremacy and it's one of its many ways. And that, and then I know I shared with you even yesterday, I feel like now I feel like kind of invincible. Like, you know, we survive, we continue to survive. We continue to thrive. Yep. Conversation will not be stopped no matter what. And our work won't be stopped. Yeah. Um, I'm very uh, yep. grateful. 100%, for... absolutely. Well, uh, maybe we can think about how this relates yep. with Asian American college students. They're going to be returning to campus in the fall. And when we think about just like right. they're navigating their own mental health experiences, I love that we're starting with our own. Um, I wonder yeah. your thoughts about how that's gonna, what that, that might look like and things that people should keep in mind. Right, you know, um, yeah, you're absolutely right that this is um, you know, time for us to, to thrive, to, to again, show our resilience, um, model, potentially, you know, one of many ways that one can possibly recover from racial trauma or at least begin the healing process when it comes to racial trauma. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the things just to name also is that um, with, uh, with the event that happened um, to us and to everyone who witnessed it, um, that uh, I think for many of us, it was even harder because it, there are already so many things happening to us yeah. and to our communities um, and to our, uh, coalition or uh, building com communities and other communities of color and so forth. Um, and uh, and so it, we just weren't as 
prepared for that sort of shock. Um, and, um, you know, and so I think that's something that we all have to remember is that we can never get too uh, comfortable or too complacent so long as white supremacy is um, alive and well, um, we always have to be prepared. Um, and that is not to say that we could have been any more prepared for what had happened. Um, but it just means that we have to be hyper vigilant um, and not even just about ourselves, but about others that we might care about, um, about other communities um, who experience things that we might not necessarily uh, experience directly. Um, but we, we always have to be ready to fight against um, white supremacy and systemic racism. Um, so related uh, to Asian American mental health, uh, you know, there are so many other things that Asian Americans are, are dealing with right now. Um, we're still amidst a global pandemic in which many people People have lost um, close loved ones, family, friends. People have lost jobs. Um, people have feared for their health and their safety. Um, and now uh, many Asian Americans um, are fearing just being able to live their lives and walk down the street um, and return to normal. Um, for many Asian Americans that I know that I've spoken to, um, there is this desire to not go back to normal because going back to normal, which means going back to school and work, um, means being out in public more, which me, might actually mean um, you know, being exposed to violence. Um, and so I think it, it's just so important for people to name um, all of these experiences. Um, if it's not something that you're thinking about every single day, uh, which is something that, you know, Asian Americans are thinking about every single day, or at least many are, um, something that Black folks are thinking about every single day for other reasons, um, you know, then that's really a privilege. Um, and we need to really, um, you know, think about why is it that certain groups are living in a world in which these are uh, at the forefront of their lives, these uh, fears, this terror, uh, this um, anxiety uh, may dictate, you know, basic decisions in their lives. Um, and as mental health practitioners, you know, I just think it's so important um, for, for people to help uh, people, others, clients, people of color specifically, um, have those conversations. Um, they might not bring it up initially in their sessions. Um, it doesn't mean they're not thinking about it. It might mean that they uh, feel shame or might mean that they um, are, uh, you know, they don't have to start that conversation. Um, and so, you know, initiating that, initiating that conversation could be really valuable um, in, you know, guiding uh, one's clients in uh, seeking that healing that they need. Yeah, it sounds like articulate or naming it and acknowledging yeah. it as real and valid. Um, I mean, it's so easy to gaslight it and just say yeah. like, it's not that big of a deal or it didn't actually happen. I know a lot of your work is also focused on microaggressions and there's so much gaslighting that happens there. Yeah. And it's, it's, a different, um, it's a different type of trauma than maybe like an overt hate crime like, like what we yeah. experienced. But I wonder if you could also speak to the detrimental impact of that. Sure, yeah, when I think about microaggressions, I think about how it is one manifestation of systemic oppression or racism or discrimination um, and how all of those things uh, impact people's mental health, um, people of color, people of historically marginalized groups. Um, and it's not just one thing. It may have been, you know, in the past that people were used to overt violence, um, but not necessarily what we now experience, which is uh, subtle forms um, of discrimination. So when I think about um, a person of historically marginalized groups, let's say Asian Americans in this case, um, they navigate a world in which they might experience overt violence like hate violence or cyber uh, violence, um, cyber racism um, is what um, I've been naming it. Um, and uh, they also might experience microaggressions, subtle forms of discrimination, things like people saying, um, you know, where are you from? Where are you really from? You speak good English, uh, making presumptions or based on stereotypes. Um, and then also systemic racism. Um, so the many ways in which our systems um, may target people of historically marginalized groups, exclude them um, from certain equities um, that uh, others may have and so forth. Um, and then with their intersectional identities might experience other things. So Asian American women um, will also deal with misogyny in addition to racism and then uh, gender racism um, and LGBTQ folks, LGBTQ Asian Americans will also experience homophobia, transphobia, um, and the intersection of all those things with racism. Um, and so um, with that, uh, you know, it, it's really important for uh, mental health practitioners um, 
to just even understand that before getting to whatever core presenting problems a person may have, um, that there is this overarching um, experience of oppression. Um, and it might be something that the person is conscious of. It might not, it might be something the person is not conscious of. Um, and in, in doing so, you know, that, um, or in, in, in talking about that, uh, it uh, you know, allows them to understand how uh, external factors, ecological factors um, influence um, you know, the very problems um, that they may have. Right. So, yeah. yeah. That sounds like that consciousness raising, like helping facilitate that identity development and that awareness yeah. um, is so crucial just for yeah. restoring that sense of dignity and being able to cope, frankly, with whatever is gonna be thrown at them. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, again, it's naming uh, the oppression, it's providing a safe space for people to talk about certain issues, it's, um, you know, creating a rapport in which uh, people know that it's okay uh, mm -hmm. to share, you know, different experiences. Um, I, I think one thing that's really important to understand is that for a lot of uh, Asian Americans and other people of other historically marginalized groups, we've been so trained um, to to not um, to, to talk about these things or um, yeah. to keep them to ourselves. Yes. Uh, like, you know, like this is an us problem. We don't need um, to tell others about these things. Um, and, and so again, I think that um, for practitioners to really uh, create that space where uh, it does normalize that conversation um, and can then lead to some of that healing. Fair enough. Um, one last question. If there's right. one thing that you could leave um, or that you would want like, administrators at colleges to know about this community? Provosts, deans, anybody who's yeah. working in, in the higher ed admin, what would you want them to know about their Asian American students? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's so important anytime I think about Asian Americans in general, and even specifically Asian American students, um, is uh, to overemphasize that we are not a monolith, that there are so many different ways to be Asian American. And so while it's important to name um, certain cultural values and patterns that might be more or less common across different um, Asian American groups, to also understand that each country of origin comes with unique histories of oppression and colonialism um, and even historical trauma. Um, that Asian Americans of different immigration uh, statuses and immigration patterns um, into this country come with um, unique perspectives um, and experiences. Uh, that Asian Americans of different phenotypes um, may experience uh, unique uh, encounters with racism and racialization, which influence mental health and their ability to navigate the world. Um, again, intersectional identities, um, things like gender, sexual orientation, social class, age, um, and so forth, I will, will influence um, in both positive and negative ways um, people's uh, experiences. So I really want folks um, to really challenge themselves to think about um, who is it that you think of when you think of Asian Americans? Um, for some, it might be you know challenging overt stereotypes that you might have of Asian Americans as being a model minority. Um, for others, it might be challenging your perceptions of East Asian equating uh, Asian um, or Asian American. Um, and then for others, it's just you know really being able to challenge um, any of your biases about what you view as being um, normalized, what you view as being healthy, what you view as being um, appropriate, right? Mm -hmm. So just as an example, um, you know, sometimes Asian American students um, are told that when their parents are too strict, um, that, um, you know, that's, it, that's pathological, or your parents are, are, you know, they're too controlling, or whatever it may be, um, instead of understanding some of the cultural nuances. Um, and so, you know, I think doing all of that work uh, is something that uh, administrators uh, can continue to think about, um, you know, really making sure that you listen to Asian American leaders who could tell you um, some of the things that are happening um, amongst uh, Asian American communities communities and even just, you know, Asian American students um, specifically. Um, and then finally, like, you know, putting money where your mouth is, you know, if we really care about Asian American yes. students, um, we have to provide them um, with those supports and resources um, that they need, um, making sure um, that there are programs that specifically uh, target, empower, enhance Asian American experiences, uh, hire uh, faculty, staff members, psychologists um, that represent um, different groups. Um, and then again, like not just hiring the one token Asian American, uh, but hiring multiple Asian Americans of diverse ethnic backgrounds, immigration statuses, 
and so forth, um, to really be able to um, provide uh, you know, all the support that they can for these students. Oh, Kevin, from your mouth to God's ears, thank you so much <laughs> for sharing all this wisdom. Thank you. Thank especially you, taking this time after what happened last week, it really means a lot to me. So thank I'm you. excited to continue this conversation and um, why don't we wrap it up here? Great, thank you and have a great panel, everyone and uh, stay woke. Once again, thanks to Dr. Kevin Nadal for providing that insightful overview and commentary at the importance of API mental health and destigmatizing these conversations and microaggressions and the APIs not being a monolith. Um, we'll get more to that now as we we're talking with our panel. So I'd like to introduce our four esteemed uh, panelists. Let's see, they should be coming up now. Great. All right. Um, first, we have uh, Dr. Anmal Satiani. Uh, counseling psychologist and assistant director for clinical training at DePaul University. We also have Dr. Henry Tan, associate vice chancellor for health equity, diversity, and inclusion at UC Davis. We have Dr. Sam Museus, professor of education studies at the University of California, San Diego. And we have Dr. Ian Shin, assistant professor of history and American culture at the University of Michigan. Welcome to you all, and thank you very much for being here today. Um, I wanted to ask you all to briefly introduce yourself and your pronouns, as well as your connection to API College Mental Health. Um, so I'll call on you as we go through. Why don't we start with Anmal and then we'll go to Sam. Sure, I'm so glad to be here this morning. Um, so I uh, actually work in a university counseling service at DePaul University. Um, and part of my work has been uh, really working with Asian American um, immigrants, refugees, uh, and students across my career. So it's um, uh, you know a clear interest of mine. My pronouns are she and hers. Thanks, I'm all. That's Sam and then Hendry. Yeah, hi everybody. Glad to be here as well. Uh, Sam Maseas. I'm a professor of education studies at the University of California, San Diego. Um, and I study how colleges and universities can create conditions for all students to thrive. Um, and part of that is creating conditions that are conducive to positive mental health. Um, in the practice arena, I've also worked with API college students, both in Asian American studies and um, within the field of education. Thanks, Sam. Andrea and then Ian. Hi everyone, so glad to be here. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. So I uh, provide oversight for uh, the diversity, equity, inclusion efforts at uh, UC Davis Health and contribute to that at um, the major, um, the, the main campus. Um, from a personal and professional standpoint, I also am a psychiatrist and um, uh, for the uh, for 10 years uh, directed a mental health clinic that uh, focused on uh, refugee and immigrant health in uh, Asian American communities. And then Ian. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Marcia said, I'm Ian Shin. I'm an assistant professor of history and American culture at the University of Michigan, where I'm also a core faculty member in our Asian Pacific Islander American Studies program. So in that capacity, um, I uh, do research and teach on Asian American studies, Asian American history, uh, and more broadly, U.S. history. And so I interact with API college students, as well as international students from Asia um, in the classroom, and also in my capacity as uh, advisor of various clubs, um, and I use he, him pronouns. Thanks so much to you all. Um, why don't we get started? I'm so excited to be having this discussion with you all. Um, Kevin talked a little bit about APIs not being a monolith. Um, I wanted to start with how API communities consist of such a vast array of communities. Um, API college students consist of, they just come from over 40 ethnic groups, so many different religious backgrounds, different nationalities, different gender and sexual identities. What do you find challenging when speaking about the needs of this community? Um, why don't we start with Ian and then we can open it up from there. Sure. Yeah, I think where I would start is to kind of double down on what um, Kevin said, which is that the diversity of this community is its greatest strength, but also one of its greatest challenges. Um, it's important to first realize, I think, as, as both you and uh, Marsha and, and Kevin have said, 
um, that being API is not a, a kind of natural, you know, sort of social or cultural identity. It's a political identity. Um, it's a political identity that emerges out of the uh, ethnic studies movements and civil rights movements in the 1960s. And so it really is important for us to ask, is this really the best way to reach our students, right? To what extent do they identify um, as API or possibly as, as something else? There's no real reason to assume that a Southeast Asian refugee or a South Asian engineer who's here on an H-1B visa or someone who's eighth generation descended from 19th century Chinese railroad workers would have some kind of common cause. And so I think one way to navigate through this diversity is a concept that the, the um, scholar Lisa Lowe calls strategic essentialism, which is to recognize when there are opportunities for the AAPI community to band together and to work together collectively for its uh, benefit without glossing over um, some of its internal differences. I think the other kind of um, thing that's challenging about speaking to the needs of this community that I would say would be that, you know, as a historian, I, I think it's really important to be careful when we're thinking about what Asian culture means when we refer to it, oftentimes as a way to explain why the API community or why API college students do or don't need certain things. Um, to, to recognize that quote unquote Asian culture is not a stable um, uh, con construct. It's actually historically produced and in the US context emerges out of very specific pieces of legislation that mean that certain segments of the community have had an easier time coming to the United States and therefore have established families. Um, so for example, you know, Kevin mentioned this idea of the model minority and AAPIs as high achieving successful students uh, and therefore not in need of great support in terms of their mental health. But what we've seen and sociologists have shown, for example, is that second generation Chinese immigrants to Spain have much lower educational attainments than second generation Chinese Americans. And that's not because Chinese immigrants to Spain are particularly lazier, right, or don't benefit from the same kind of Confucian culture. It's because those countries have different kinds of admission standards and immigration policies than the United States does. And so when we factor these things into account, we can have a more dynamic and nuanced understanding of culture that I think will go a great deal towards helping to support the mental health needs of AAPI students in colleges and universities. Mm. Thank you so much, Ian. How about other folks? Um, what do you find challenging when talking about the needs of this community? Well, I did want to um, just uh, uh, elaborate on Ian's point about uh, you know we're not a monolith, and I would say from a from from my standpoint, it is challenging to have discussions with leadership when. The data that you have is just uh, this, you know, uh, uh, aggregated data that really obscures the uh, the, the challenges that uh, some API groups uh, have. You know, uh, the educational disparities, for example, uh, for Southeast Asian um, uh, students is tremendous, and the uh, poverty that uh, that many Southeast Asian, you know. Uh, 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 Khmer uh, uh, communities, for example, experiences uh, quite significant. So the barriers to educational attainment are very significant, but if you don't disaggregate uh, the data, that all gets obscured. And, um, you know, I, I also uh, wanna um, point out that uh, Pacific Islander communities as well have been very much uh, obscured because of the lack of disaggregation of data. And we're, we're seeing that with uh, COVID-19 where Pacific Islander communities uh, are uh, particularly hard hit uh, by this. And yet uh, the data uh, infrastructure is very limited because of our tendency in, in, uh, in this country to look at uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders as a uh, monolithic culture. Thanks, Andrew. I'm Miller Sam. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that, um, you know, I think it's also challenging when students themselves don't necessarily identify with this label. Um, and, you know, they may identify with their ethnic uh, identity, for example, but not with the label. And so then um, what does that mean when um, people in a university are trying to advocate for resources for this, you know, for this umbrella group if the students themselves are not really you know, and I think that's a challenge for um, Asian American cultural centers, for example, to sort of draw in, 
the uh, broader group of you know students from these forty countries, uh, you know that may benefit from the services when the students themselves are saying, you know, that's not really how I think about myself. Right. Right. For sure. Um, I think uh, I echo everything my colleague said. I'll just add one uh, brief point um, related to all of those earlier comments. I think that there are a lot of different dynamics that contribute to the marginalization of subgroups within the AAPI category. Um, and one of them is that the, the sort of structures in society like the media tend to pick up and focus on the depictions of AAPIs, but really Asian and Asian Americans that conform to dominant uh, sort of stereotypes and assumptions about what AAPIs are. Um, and because of that, uh, you, you often don't see Pacific Island or Southeast Asian um, and other voices that uh, are belong to smaller groups um, and have very different experiences within the larger umbrella. Um, and then internally, I think that there's ways that those groups also can be marginalized. So I think that um, oftentimes when we have conversations uh, about AAPIs, uh, we are privileging the voices of East Asian communities. Um, and so I think it's important for us to really think about how we're complicating the narrative constantly um, and making sure that all voices that are impacted by the conversation are centered in it. Yes, I appreciate all these points so much. So I'm hearing, knowing the, the, the history of the community and the nuance of each immigrant group, as well as um, the various levels of positionality that those, those groups arrive with and what their stressors are here, and knowing how to who is in the community as well as get, being able to disaggregate and actually know who is in your own specific API community. This part about folks not identifying with the label I think is also so important that it's it's such a nuanced political label that a lot of people don't feel any affiliation with. And so us even talk, having this conversation can feel a little um, I'm wary about it as well as us trying to encourage a conversation as well. Um, Amal, I was wondering, as a psychologist um, in the counseling center world, I wonder if you can speak to the barriers that Asian American Pacific Islanders face when accessing formal mental health services, like going to see a psychotherapist or a counselor. What kind of barriers do they face in, on campus? Yeah, I, I think there are, there are quite a few. Um, I mean, some are more internal. So for example, thinking, you know, you have to be quote unquote crazy or weak uh, to seek counseling. So that, that can definitely be one of them, or it's only for really, really sick people. It's not for me. Um, and I think, you know, some of the cultural attitudes may, may influence that kind of thinking, but, you know, I think also it's just not part of the cultural norm for many groups and subgroups in this AAPI community to seek help in this way. And so it may be more normative to go to a physician, a primary care physician, um, or some sort of medical professional um, and really be focused on somatic concerns, for example. Um, and so, you know, I think that that can definitely influence whether or not somebody is seeking help from a, a counseling service on campus. I think also um, there can be a, this sense of, you know, there's something, there, there's, there's something wrong with me if I have to seek out help, right? Rather than thinking uh, this thinking that um, there are also a lot of systemic factors that influence someone's mental health, as we've been talking about already, including racism. You know, I mean, there are people that come to therapy to talk about racism, um, sexism, heterosexism, et cetera. And so I think that um, that can be another barrier. Uh, I think also culturally, this idea of, um, you know, airing one's dirty laundry to, you know, to a stranger, to someone outside the family can be really challenging. Um, you know, the question of how, how can it help to talk to, to a stranger? Um, just not, not really understanding how it can be helpful. Um, sometimes a perception, it can actually make things worse. Um, and I think also more systemically, you know, just a lack of access to AAPI counselors uh, can be a factor. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, I, I, as Dr. Nadal was saying earlier, 
there, there can be this sort of token person in a counseling service um, rather than thinking more broadly that, yes, this is a very diverse group um, and we, we really need to think about um, how to have multiple people who maybe right. can serve the needs of AAPI students. Um, and he did a really great job of illustrating that. Um, when he talked, um, cost can be a barrier. Um, I think a lot of counseling services try not to, to, to really charge or they charge a not nominal fee. So just to try to, um, you know, think about that barrier. Um, I think time can be a barrier for students. Um, I definitely work with students who are working multiple jobs to get themselves through college. And so do I really have time for this, you know? Um, and one thing I've heard a lot um, from AAPI students is, um, you know, other people probably need this more than me. Mm. You know, maybe, maybe I don't, you know, someone else maybe deserves this more. Um, and I think some of this can be related to this model minority myth of, you know, I should have it all together. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't really um, need this kind of help. Um, other people probably have it worse. So I, I, I think that that uh, sometimes comes into play. Um, you know, I also think that it can be difficult for people in the university community to refer um, for, because of some of these barriers. Uh, and I think uh, understanding some of these barriers can be really, really helpful. That's something that I talk with faculty and staff a lot about. Um, mm -hmm. They call me and say, I'm trying to get a student to you, but I'm not sure how to, how to do it. Um, and then, you know, I do also just want to make the point, there are other barriers, sure, I'm sure that I'm not, that are not coming to mind in the moment, but um, I'm also just thinking about, uh, I think there's often a perception that it's the counseling service that should be responsible for students' mental health, AAPI students' mental health, and I just want to make the point that even as a psychologist, I, I argue that uh, it's really everyone in the university community that, that is responsible for the mental health of these students. Um, and not all of them are gonna to come to the counseling service anyway. And we know that the, the AAPI students um, tend to underutilize services such as counseling centers. But um, I think there are a lot of creative ways to uh, work to help uh, students and to contribute to their, their mental health. Um, and at the same time, I do think that many counseling services are under-resourced and really could use um, more uh, staff and more resources in general to serve serve this group. So that's some of what's coming to mind. Fair enough. Thanks, Emil. Um, I just that dovetails really well with. I was wanting to go to. Um, we know that like lots of colleges and universities kind of stake mental health efforts as being on the counseling and psychological services department. Um, and we know that API students, they're the, the least likely demographic to actually go seek out those services. They have a, I mean, it echoes for sure the underutilization in the broader API community about going to seek mental health treatment, um, especially before there's a crisis, um, in which case, you know, things are a lot, a lot harder to treat at that point. Um, I wonder if I could ask all of you what institutions can do um, to better support their Asian American Pacific Islander students besides directing them to on-campus counseling. Um, and Ian, I wonder if you could get us started first with talking about how Asian American studies departments in particular um, play a role in promoting API well-being on campus. Sure, absolutely. Um, and for those who maybe aren't as familiar with the field of API studies or API studies, there goes by lots of different names, Asian American studies, you know, it's, it's a field of study that's now a half a century old. Um, and it really, as I said earlier, emerges out of the Bay Area in the late 1960s as part of this broader push towards ethnic studies that was advocating for people of color and indigenous people to have a seat at the table in academia in terms of curriculum development, in terms of faculty appointments, uh, et cetera. Um, it looks different at different institutions at the University of Michigan where, I'm, where I sit, um, uh, Asian American Studies, AAPI Studies as part of um, a larger department, uh, our Department of American Culture. At other institutions, it's a standalone department. At other institutions, it's a certificate program or an institute. It can take lots of different forms. But overall, um, I think what AAPI, API Studies does is it provides a space where AAPI students feel that they belong, right? And we talked a little, a lot about belonging um, and about uh, the fact that it's important not to gaslight students about uh, the experiences that they face. And I think what AAPI uh, studies does is um, it provides a space where API students 
feel that their life experiences and their experiences of racism especially are taken as normative, that they're not questioned. Um, and, and that's a really important kind of uh, uh, a baseline uh, to provide. I think more than that, and this is why Asian American studies is good not just for AAPI students, but for all students, is because it's not just a navel gazing exercise. I think that's one of the, sort of the assumptions about Asian American studies is, is you know, you're just looking at your family or just looking at your own you know, identity. It really is a method for understanding, critiquing, and ultimately to dismantle the systems of inequality that we all face. And so it's a really critical methodology, not just for the API community, but that benefits uh, the entire campus. I'll stop there because I'm sure Anmol and Hendry and, and Sam have other thoughts as well. Thanks so much, Ian. Yeah, how about the rest of you? Could be about Asian American studies specifically or even broader, more broadly. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say that um, many of the AAPI students that I've worked with who have taken courses in Asian American studies have benefited tremendously. And I think that a lot of this does contribute to positive mental health because first of all, they're meeting faculty that look like them. They are learning about their, their own community's history. Um, they also, I think, are, um, I think, really benefiting from uh, just this contribution to their self-esteem, their self-worth, um, seeing themselves positively. So I, I think that uh, this kind of experience can be transformational, really. Um, and, and I think that um, it's, a, I think, the combination of the knowledge, the connection with, with faculty who may understand them, uh, and also just the, the self-awareness. Um, and then it sometimes prompts them to go to their families, their, their parents, their grandparents, and explore more of their history and the impact of that history on their family, which helps also connection with the family. So I, I think that there, there are just many ways in which it's really powerful to see, um, to see the impact from where I sit. And just to add to uh, what Edmo and and Ian was saying about history. I, I do think that that is uh, such a critical uh, piece of, of all of this. You know, when you experience a, 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 a racial violence or, or hate, the first thing as Marcia, you pointed out is that we internalize it. We think, what did I do wrong? Or what is it about me that, um, that I'm the target of this? And um, when, be, because in the United States, there's a relative erasure of, um, of Asian American Pacific Islander history uh, from the history books. And so many Asian American students grow up not really understanding the contributions and also the resilience and, uh, and trials and, and tribulations of uh, Asian American communities. And so when you experience a, a hateful act, in that context of that history, you have a buffer. You can say, you know, actually, I'm not an outsider actually i do deserve better because my my you know my cultures have contributed to american history and there's a history of systemic racism against asian americans that date back centuries and so when i experience this hateful act i can understand it as not a problem within me but a problem that's a legacy of our society our country and that's a really important frame um, for all of us, but particularly our young people to be able to have so that um, we, we, we target, you know, we really center the, the problem and mm -hmm. where it actually is, which is the structural and historical racism rather than the, the, the individual person. But without an understanding and exposure to Asian American history, we lose out on, um, on that uh, perspective and that um, uh, point of strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree completely. I was going to add too that then an Asian um, American studies program can be a kind of home to also, in some cases, process this whatever racial trauma someone is experiencing, and that can be really powerful too. To know that there are people that are going to understand and support. So, sorry, Sam. I think you were going to say something. Oh no, that's okay. Thanks for for sharing that thought, and and um, I. Just want to add a couple uh, additional thoughts to all the great comments that have been made. Several years ago, I was giving a presentation to a committee that was focused on increasing success among diverse student populations at uh, this university. 
that will remain nameless. Um, and I was presenting on the importance of culturally relevant curricula and, and the dean of the College of Liberal Arts at that university sort of just questioned the whole idea that we should have curriculum that's relevant to communities of color. Um, and and the, the rationale was that we're in the business of getting people to go outside of their comfort zone and challenging themselves to open up their minds. And my response to that is, well, if you and your histories and your community have been centered in the education system your entire life, that means something different than you know, situations in which your community has been invisible and you haven't had the opportunity to learn about these things, that is challenging too. Um, so I think that there are some really deeply embedded assumptions that we have to challenge and overcome uh, as, as a system um, mm -hmm. in order to really value Asian American studies or API studies or ethnic studies in the ways that, that they should be valued. Um, and, and then the other point that I wanted to make was, you know, this idea of relevance is it should be the bare minimum that mm -hmm. we provide as educators. And we've been talking about the importance of relevant education for many, many decades. Uh, but oftentimes today, because of our society, we think about it in terms of how relevant the education is to one's career. Mm -hmm. um, but there are all these other aspects of one's life um, that can all that education can also be relevant to. Um, and that should be the just the very basic sort of thing that we provide students. Um, and then the last comment was I, I just wanted to piggyback on Anmol's comment. Um, in addition to providing the, the relevant education, um, oftentimes on campuses where there is not a diverse administration and staff and faculty. Um, Asian American studies or API studies is the one place that students can go in order to connect with support people who understand the issues that they're facing, right? The cultural context, the racial issues, um, and, and other things that are heavily shaping their experience. So um, they're critical in terms of providing that sort of culturally responsive and, and holistic support as well. Yeah. Taking all of your points to heart, the, um, I like the idea of like this being a cultural home as well as like a home for racial healing. And it sounds like so much of this is underscored by um, the historical invisibility of these stories. I know a lot of students just don't feel like they they've ever really had their own story centered ever in their educational experience. Um, and Henry, to your point of like this, these are the places that people can go to, to, to find themselves, um, to feel that sense of belongingness, as well as to heal from all of this historical racial trauma that's happened. Um, uh, it makes me think also about, I wonder about other ways outside of Asian American studies departments um, that universities can or colleges can try to better support, better provide for this community. We're talking about providing more affirmation, more sense of belonging, more sense of being known. I know a lot of folks at Hunter have talked about like, nobody really knows my story. And I, I certainly don't know my Asian American story and nobody knows my story. I don't know how I fit in that story. And I don't know, you know, I come here and I do my classes but I don't ever really truly feel known. Um, I wonder if there are other ways besides instituting these departments that might also improve support for these students on campus, um, still outside of referring them to counseling and wellness or counseling and psychological services. Well, I, I think one of the, um, I'll just start start us off. It's, uh, you know, one of, one of the issues, uh, particularly around the recent uh, uh, hate has been the, um, you know, uh, the majority of the, the uh, hate incidents that we've seen through the, uh, you know, stop AAPI hate uh, uh, data um, has been that the majority of them have been in public places or in workplaces. And so there's a sense, I think for a lot of AAPI that um, my pain doesn't matter to those around me. Mm. My pain is invisible. And I think that that really, I think con connects with the experiences um, at least for, for my patients um, that they've experienced over the decades, that um, 
my pain actually doesn't matter to other people in, in ways that um, that others matter. And so I, I think that what what universities can do as a, a starting point is to acknowledge and um, make a make a strong statement against um, uh, anti-Asian hate and bullying. And uh, you know, of course, there needs to be more uh, done than just a statement. But that's a really important. Uh, Thing to do, which is the 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 recognition, right, of the pain. Um, so I'll, I'll, again, just a starting point, but a really important uh, starting point. And when leadership does that, it's it what it does. I think is it's um, it's uh, it makes a a state a strong statement for others um, uh, within the university to then uh, follow through with those statements as well. Hmm. Just go ahead, Amal. Oh, no, go ahead, Ian. It's okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to um, say to piggyback off of what Henry said, but I think one of the things, um, and, and I totally agree that um, it, it shouldn't just fall on APIA studies or API studies uh, programs, courses, and faculty to do this kind of support work. Um, you know, I, I think I did hear in the aftermath of the March shootings, and we should also mention that, you know, we haven't mentioned that the Indianapolis shootings, four That's of the right. victims there were members of the Sikh community. Uh, and it's another, you know, kind of illustration of how sometimes members of the API community can sort of slide under radar, even within very, you know, kind of attuned and nuanced conversations about API identity. But in any case, what I, what I mean to say is that I think, um, you know, in March and April, when those uh, tragedies happened, you know, that I, when I addressed them in, in my courses, um, you know, students said, you know, this was the only course in which uh, they, you know, happened to hear from the professor, you know, to, to sort of acknowledge that that had happened and to sort of say, you know, if you need space to process, feel free to come talk to me, or if you, you know, want to take the day off, you know, feel free to do that. Um, and I think any professor, any faculty member, any instructor should be doing that kind of acknowledgement as well, um, so that it's not, um, again, just the responsibility of AAPI identified faculty to do that. I understand that there may be um, barriers to that because people may not feel comfortable with doing that kind of work because they haven't been trained to have those kinds of conversations. Um, and I, I really sympathize with that. I mean, I often say, you know, I, I wasn't trained to teach writing, but here I am teaching writing. It's sort of the same kind of uh, issue um, and barriers uh, that, that faculty may face. And so I think institutions do have to provide that kind of resource to help folks understand how to approach these conversations, because they will continue to happen, unfortunately, given the kind of tenor of national and international politics, um, you know, to, to be ready to support students when these things happen. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, Ian. That was necessary. Yeah, I was going to say something similar, just regular acknowledgement of what's happening um, in classrooms and even more broadly. And I think about just another way of being proactive versus reactive, having uh, speakers come on a regular basis that are speaking to API concerns or history or because I do think, uh, as others have said, one of the um, one thing that often comes up is that the, the history is erased. People don't know um, where, you know, where people are from, what's happened in those countries, what, what the experiences are in terms of migration and then resettlement, et cetera. So I think having regular conversations in a university community in different parts of the campus, um, you know, uh, I think would be beneficial to, to many people, to faculty, to staff, administrators, uh, and students. I'll um, reinforce and, and extend some of those comments. I'm somebody who believes that if you can't serve, understand first and serve second, uh, the diverse students who are on our campuses, then you can't do your job effectively. Um, and in order to serve communities that have been invisibilized, have been marginalized historically, that requires work. It requires, you know, putting in energy and time to understand those populations and re envision your practice in order to most effectively serve them. Um, and so I, I wanted to just piggyback on Ian's point that, you know, institutions need to provide support. 
um, but also view this as like a lifelong learning process because that that kind of change transformation among educators doesn't happen overnight. Um, so there needs to be a serious investment of significant resources in creating structures and eventually cultures on campus um, that are just conducive to that kind of activity to make it normal for people to constantly be enhancing their knowledge about diverse communities and comfortable taking uh, chances, making mistakes and fixing them and moving on so that they can improve um, and serve these populations more effectively. So a long-term commitment to transformation this sounds like essential for these, these goals. I like the practical, like in the moment of acknowledging to Hendrinian's point immediately, as well as also thinking about um, uh, long-term, what does it mean to really be able to, and Anmal, I think it's really practical too about just who, who do you value when you're bringing in faces and experiences? You know, how do you, how do you, and what kind of, um, your Asian American students, your Pacific Islander students are watching you, you know, like they, they want to know that they're, they have significance in this, in this college community. Um, Sam, I know you've done a lot of research and critical thinking on creating culturally engaging campus environments, trademark, registered trademark. How can campuses improve overall cultural competence? I mean, we usually spend a lot of time on interpersonal interactions, like each professor needs to know how to not microaggress, you know, their students. Um, I'm thinking about from an institutional point of view, what can be done to improve holistic campus climate? Uh, so I think, I think we've covered a lot of it. So I'll, uh, but I'll reinforce a couple of points that are really important. Um, one is I think balancing, uh, giving sufficient support to um, critical structures like API studies with uh, transformation of the larger campus to be more culturally responsive. Um, I think the second one that we, we haven't talked uh, as much about is the, the issue of prioritization. Um, and I think one of the things that happens um, when we talk about issues of inclusion and equity in general is that they get tacked on as like a, a, an additional uh, uh, value or add on um, after all of the other things that institutions care about, like their prestige and economic sustainability and, and all of those things. And I think that campuses need to have some uh, really difficult conversations about how they can really prioritize these kinds of issues, which might mean deprioritizing other issues that might not be as important. Um, maybe not ignoring them completely, but moving them down the ladder of prioritization. Um, and then the, the last point I was going to make is that, you know, um, Ian mentioned the, the shooting in Atlanta, which, you know, was a horrendous uh, incident. But even now, I think that there are a lot of inclusion and equity spaces, spaces that are designed for those conversations that don't see AAPIs as a part of the discussion or a legitimate part of the discussion. Um, and I think it's only because of the Atlanta incident and the year, year and a half of violence leading up to it that many people are starting to have this conversation now. And I, for one, fear that uh, in the very near future, we'll go back to business as usual and, and systemically just start ignoring these populations and these conversations again. Um, so I think those of us who do inclusion and equity work also have to come to grips with the reality that um, these populations have been invisibilized in many of the spaces that we've created as well. Um, and that means that our institutions making sure that all groups that have been harmed systemically by the institutions that they're at are included and centered in the conversation. That makes me appreciate like, um, like the, the feeling of the urgency of this conversation, like we're going to lose, you know, the attention, we're going to lose the moment, we're going to lose people's investment or interest. Um, in thinking about Asian, in considering API students as part of a racial equity conversation. Um, and I wonder if something, something that happens when we feel stressed about that is like, we just need to get the most clear, 
unnuanced message completely pushed through while we have their attention. And it, you lose all this nuance of how are South Asian American experiences different from Southeast Asian American experiences? Where are Filipino Americans in this conversation? How about Pacific Islander Americans? Where do they, how do we represent all the needs of everybody when we feel like the moment is just so, you know, like small, like it's just so quick. Um, and um, yeah, I know it's a it's generally a complication, especially as students continue to feel marginalized even within our conversation. Um, I wonder if any of you all have other thoughts though about um, broadly, maybe what cultural competence would look like to you on a campus or holistically what campuses can do to improve um, um, their, their, their ability to meet students where they are and provide for them. I know Sam, we've already covered a lot already, so no, no worries, but um, I did wanna open it up to the rest of you if you had other thoughts too. I think also listening to the students on that specific campus, you know, what, what are they experiencing specifically in that, you know, is it, um, is there, are there experiences that are unique that are happening on that campus or in that geographic area or something, but really, you know, listening to what's happening for them in the classroom on campus um, in other spaces. Uh, and I think that oftentimes students are in the position of, um, of needing to advocate for themselves as a group. Um, and I know that we can, of course, support them in our roles in universities, so, you know, supporting that. I, I think also it would be, uh, I think it's helpful if administrators come to them and say, we want to hear what's happening for you. Um, let's come to your student organization meeting, or let's meet you in the cultural space. Um, so I, I think that uh, really hearing their voices is critical in all of this. I think along just, the lines, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Henry. Henry. We're all so polite, so let's just talk. You have the floor, Mike. <laughs> I, I just wanted to quickly add on to what Amos said uh, that, um, you know, in terms of who institutions listen to, you know, we, we haven't talked about some of the other stakeholders um, that I think have uh, something to contribute. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking of parents and I'm also thinking of alumni, um, mm -hmm. that there are lots of opportunities to actually gain an advantage. There's incentives to be had in engaging, um, you know, for example, API alumni um, in their experiences, their understanding, and then eventually maybe their resources to support some of the programs and initiatives that you wish to develop. Some of, you know, my own experience, both as a college alumni and also as a faculty member is watching really engaged alumni get involved in pushing forward uh, greater resources for API students. Uh, and that means, you know, that the institution is more connected to, you know, that particular segment of its alumni base. So I think thinking comprehensively beyond just the student population is something else that uh, institutions can do to be more culturally competent. You know, I was, I was thinking about, um, Sam, you, your, your comments about, um, you know, prioritizing uh, often means deprioritizing. And I think, I think it is, as an administrator, I, I definitely um, struggle with that. And, um, and it, is a, it is a significant challenge. And so sometimes um, but there, there are uh, there are spaces where you can minimize that um, that sort of zero sum uh, uh, situation. And what I would say is that you know when when um, when there was a lot of pain around um, uh, uh, API hate, uh, we saw in in my communities the uh, Black African American communities really. Uh, rallying around um, our Asian American Pacific Islander community for solidarity. And um, what community leaders said was, you were there for us and we're here for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that was a, such a powerful uh, statement that if, if there was a way that we can translate that into what we do um, at our colleges and, and universities, I think that, that, that that's important. And so some of the things that, um, some reflections I have around uh, uh, actualizing that at, at our institutions is number one, uh, you know, where are the spaces for uh, uh, different uh, student affinity groups to come together on a regular basis to talk about uh, racial equity in general, to talk about uh, inclusion 
um, uh, and what it means for their uh, respective uh, uh, groups and what it's mean for them as a whole as well. I think developing those kinds of relationships um, uh, will help will help the, the, the groups and as Anmal said, the, the, the students themselves to help us to know what they need in the moment mm. at, uh, and what needs to be prioritized in the moment. So engaging, engaging folks at, um, I think at that level. And then, you know, broad ethnic studies, racial equity, racial justice um, learning um, that is inclusive of um, API perspectives, but also broad um, to include, um, you know, uh, multi-ethnic uh, experiences and perspectives. When we uplift the knowledge around racial equity um, for our whole community, it benefits um, specific communities as well. And this is not to say that um, time, um, that it replaces time uh, needed for specific uh, groups because that's important, but it's a good starting point to get everybody, um, you know, um, uh, 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 understanding the core, the core concepts, core uh, approaches and strategies for racial equity in, in the universities and, and in our country. Um, so just some, just some thoughts about, you know, um, what you can do, especially um, uh, in the beginning to really set the stage um, for racial equity and to put together structures and relationships mm -hmm. that can then be, um, be helpful when you're trying to prioritize. Mm -hmm. I'm appreciating the long game. Oh, Sam, go, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just I was just going to add a point because I really appreciate the the comments um, Henry just made around solidarity. Um, and earlier, I made a, a comment about how API communities can be marginalized within uh, inclusion and equity spaces. But I didn't talk about the systemic context around that, right? So that doesn't happen in a vacuum. The reality is our our system, our institutions allocate a little bit of the pie to these communities. And then with the very limited resources and energy and time, there, there can be um, prioritization of one community over another and sometimes even competition. And so I think that solidarity across groups to really push for uh, greater prioritization at the university, greater attention and um, a bigger piece of the pie, so to speak, is really important. I just wanted to reinforce that. Yeah. I'm thinking about all the ways that we get caught up in really competing against each other and losing sight of the triangulation that's happened historically with Black and API communities, as well as the idea of who's a good immigrant versus a bad immigrant with Brown and API uh, immigrants as well, like who's high achieving and who's not, and um, as well as the same, those same themes existing within our own community itself. Uh, so long, the long commitment to transformation is like a long game, you know, it's a long game um, idea. Um, I want to ask one more question and then we'll go to our question and answers. We have some really good, um, really good questions that have come in. Um, and that is really about, Henry, I was thinking about you specifically as an administrator, but I'm opening this up to all of you. What can we do to help, um, or what can administrators do to bring attention? What can we, what, what, can we advise them to do to help them get more support? They're here, they're watching this, they're wanting, we're, we're wanting to um, arm them with the tools or the techniques that might help them on campus be able to build more support to advocate more for the student community. I wonder what advice you have for all of them. Well, so, so uh, I think that the, the, first, the first step is um, develop relationships. You know, um, a lot of a lot of what's um, the challenge of leadership is that uh, and administration is that we go into the situation um, with only one eye because uh, of power and positionality. People aren't going to be able to to share with us candid opinions, candid experiences unless there's a trusting relationship. So don't wait till um, till the crisis to try to develop trusting relationships. Um, do that beforehand. Uh, you know, uh, uh, folks on here suggested attending, um, you know, meetings. I try to make that a regular part of my practice is to attend our student um, multicultural uh, advisory council. Mm. Um, so I, we have a council. 
that um, our executive leadership, uh, uh, you know, regularly attends. That's how we develop uh, relationships. Um, be a mentor as well. You know, uh, being a mentor gives you uh, gives you the opportunity to really connect with uh, a student, their experience at a personal level. It sort of awakens within uh, within the administrator that history of having been there, which can sometimes be lost when you're trying to deal with you know um, uh, executive level decision making challenges. But it's so important to keep that. The other thing I will say and um, is around making making um, statements and backing it up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the important things about um, administration is that um, our words are are backed by our power, and our silence is hurtful. So that's really important to to understand is that um, when you're in a position of power where you control resources, you control influences, your words actually have have more have quite an impact and your lack of words have quite an impact as well and that's what we've seen at our institution is um, when we when we've struggled to make um, uh, particular uh, take uh, statements of solidarity that um, that that exacerbates the, the the trauma and the feeling of alienation and isolation but statements are not enough they're the beginning but they're not the end and so it's really important to back that up with um, as you know the panelists here creating safe spaces you know do you have a um, a protocol that you use to uh, to discuss racial trauma um, you know uh, it, it should be a, one of those you know um, acute response uh, protocols that you have you know so that you have resources you have a team that can be mobilized you can have a process that can be mobilized when um, there's uh, there's racial trauma, but you should also have that as a regular um, uh, 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 offering as well. And so, you know, that's what we have at UC Davis is that we have a monthly uh, racial healing circles that mm -hmm. we open to, to everybody. But we also have racial healing circles that are focused on contemporary um, issues and, and hurts. So we can activate that uh, fairly quickly. And the thing is, um, Sometimes, you know, sometimes people, some people will need that, to need to be there for that. Other people need for it to be there mm. and they don't necessarily need to use it. We call that um, in, in therapy and I'm all, um, you know more about this. We call that the, the, the holding space. Right. You know, people don't necessarily need to use the holding space, but to know that the holding space is there is often uh, quite therapeutic. So, um, so, so, and then the, the final thing I'll say is that, um, you know, if, if you look at um, DEI circles, and if you look at leadership circles, uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders are underrepresented severely. And this is across the board. This is not just at universities and health systems. This is in tech industries. This is, this is across the board. And, um, you know, we know from studies that uh, diverse leaders uh, make better decisions. Um, and at an executive level, you need to make good decisions. But without um, an API uh, perspective, you know, institutions are going to be significantly hampered in the ability to make decisions that speak to the needs of our API uh, students and faculty. And so that's another part of it is that. Uh, they're, 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 uh, it's really important to, to cultivate uh, diversity in the, the leadership levels, as well as in the faculty levels and, and the students level as well. But we're seeing, you know, we're seeing more better representation at the student and faculty level, but leadership levels lag behind quite significantly still. To this point about diversity, improving the campus, the decision making, as well as the campus culture for everybody, regardless of whether they identify as AAP or not, is so important. Like this, everybody benefits from having these departments, from having these um, healing circles, from having these things named. Um, how about other folks, other things that administrators can do? We've covered a lot of ground, so it's okay, yeah. This isn't a suggestion, but Hendry, I just really like the idea of having the um, 
racial healing circles and like a, a team that's that's ready that's there and that it does work regularly um i was doing uh racial trauma uh, workshops telereach workshops this year and i first just started with the first quarter um and then i realized there was so much interest and need uh that i ended up doing it through the the, the entire year um and i just noticed that some people would um you know actively participate and discuss their you know racial traumas what's been happening to them on campus or more broadly and others would just uh would actually email me and just say i'm so glad you're doing this and wouldn't necessarily attend but i think it was helpful for them to know it existed and one thought i've been having all year was how could this be institutionalized um you know in a in, you know i'm just I'm one person doing it in one department but how could it be broader than that so i just i really loved that, that idea And I appreciate the proactive versus reactive, like what can you have just standardized throughout the year, knowing that the world is not going to change significantly with or this need will be there. And so how do we anticipate that and create and create be creative about it, resources that need to exist? Sam, I cut you off though. You're going to say something. No, no. Um, so I I've was reflecting on just the context that we're in right now, historically and socially. And, um, you know, prior to 2020, um, the, the sort of two decades before that or three decades before that, our society moved further and further uh, in this hyper capitalist direction where um, there's just you know, m multiplying exponentially um, pressures on youth um, and drastically growing wealth inequality that puts even more pressure on communities that um, are marginalized and are not um, hyper privileged in society. And then we had the pandemic. Um, we also over the last decade had uh, increased centering of racial tensions that many people were not involved in anymore and are now involved in, which is a difficult thing to do. Um, so I'm thinking about all these pressures and I'm just thinking this is a lot. Um, and it's not surprising then that we see mental health issues increasing drastically on college campuses in recent years. And none of these things are changing anytime soon. So it's not likely that we'll see a, a reverse in the direction of things. Um, and, you know, I, I guess one of the things that I wanted to say is that campuses um, need to not go about business as usual um, and, and operate, operating like corporations um, with their own bottom line in mind first. And I know this is uh, easier said than done, uh, but institutions really need to think about how they can humanize the experience for students and really see people as human beings and create environments that are more conducive to human thriving. Um, that's what I see at the core of all of this. Um, and then to Anmol's point about students and, and engaging students, um, in the work that we've done with a lot of campuses around inclusion and equity issues um, at my institute, uh, one of the things that I've observed is that a lot of administrators view student activists as this problem. They're, they're like something that, you know, causes a disruption every once in a while and we try to minimize that, wait them out, they'll graduate. Um, how do we, how do we um, keep things as least disruptive as possible so that the alumni don't get upset about the activists um, and, and we don't have this sort of ballooning of the problems uh, that exist. And I think that's really the wrong way to look at things. I think student activists who are fighting for more equitable institutions are um, one of the most underutilized resources and uh, fantastic partners and re-envisioning campuses and would have a lot of great things to say about the things that we're talking about um, that many administrators and faculty might not even think about. 
Um, and so I, I wanted to reinforce on most point and just say viewing student activists and student leaders who are already doing a lot of this work um, as critical key partners um, in the effort is really important. And I, I wish that more administrators uh, and faculty would do that. Um, I'm going to switch us now to a little bit of Q&A. We don't have a ton of time, but we'll use as much as we have. Um, one question that we had was, as the fall comes and we welcome students back, some in person, what are you preparing for and are forecasting that other faculty and staff should be prepared for as they seek to support APIA students, mental health, and other needs? Uh, we haven't talked a lot about the on-campus the pandemic just transitioning that we're going through right now and what that might look like. Um, I wonder, yeah, what advice you might have for faculty and staff? I've just been noticing that a lot of the focus seems to be on, um, you know, when are faculty and staff coming back to campus, when are students coming back to campus, the, the whole issue of the requirement of the vaccine or not. I think there's been less attention from what I've seen to what is, you know, look at what these students have been through um, during this COVID pandemic, racial pandemic, racial racism pandemic mental health pandemic, um, and what does that mean as they're coming back? It's the sort of trauma upon trauma upon trauma. And uh, how are we, yeah, how are we preparing for that? I just, I guess just want to comment that I haven't put a whole lot of discussion about that. Uh, but I guess what I would say is just based on the students that I have been um, talking with this year, that uh, I think it's, it's going to be tough for a lot of students. And I think it's going to be tough for a lot of AAPI students. Um, talk to a lot of students who've uh, had COVID themselves, their family members have had COVID, there have been deaths in the family, in some cases they weren't able to attend funerals. Um, and just, you know, seeing what's been happening as far as racism in the communities, I, I, I think it's been a lot. It's been a lot. And so I just wonder, you know, what where are the spaces of healing as these students return, as, as they're, they're trying to readjust um, to being on campus? You know, it's a lot of readjustment as well. Um, so, yeah, I, it's just a, a more the more question than than an answer, really. But I think yeah, I think these students have been through a tremendous amount. Um, I, I think one of the answers that I might hazard um, to both Marsha, your question and, and the question that uh, Anmol then elaborated on dovetails on another question that we have, you know, about um, what staff and faculty can do to communicate to students that using campus resources is a sign of strength and resourcefulness. And the, the, the way I see these connecting is to be transparent as faculty and staff about the struggles we ourselves have faced um, in order to normalize an environment and culture of asking for help and seeking help when you need it. Um, that it's, you know, it's not because we're adults or we've gone through, you know, college that we suddenly are now, you know, um, inured to, to these pressures and these stresses that we ourselves, you know, have uh, gone through, you know, um, not suggesting that people should share their health histories with their students, but you know that there have been sort of struggles that we ourselves have gone through, and that we have sought help. Uh, whether it's you know I talk to my students about my journey to you know going to, to to therapy and and you know being very kind of transparent about the fact that I also in the past have had to seek help, and that I I you know on my syllabi write that you know I uh, regard any question that's asked of me or coming to office hours as a sign of strength, right, and as a sign of courage, um, and I try to create um, that atmosphere uh, as much as I can. Can. I think the other thing I would just sort of say quickly about the transition back to in person, and this has to do with the safety issue, is that I think one of the things that especially API activists have been very careful um, to, to note is that, you know, when you're thinking about how to make the campus safe or what that feels like for people, that it means very different things. And so, for example, there might be considerations about, you know, what kind of law enforcement presence will be on campus, you know, because you want to care for or watch out for, you know, the security and safety of your API students that may not actually feel safe for other members of the campus community. So I think taking account for the, the kind of um, the, the holistic kind of sense of security of everyone uh, on campus is something else that people should consider as they're planning for the return to campus this fall. Awesome. Andrew and Sam, any other closing thoughts? No pressure. 
I'll, I'll piggyback on, on Ian's comment because I thought it was a, a good one. Um, just to say that that um, vulnerability is something that is beaten out of us when we're trained to be academics um, and be a part of the academy. Um, we're taught to be less human um, and, you know, that we shouldn't be wrong, that we shouldn't have problems, that we shouldn't um, be vulnerable. And I think that that requires uh, some significant reflection among faculty and administrators and, and uh, commitment to do that. It's something that's not easy, uh, but I think I also think it's extremely important. Um, and then the, the one thing that I was going to add is, you know, I, I was just reading the results of a survey from the American Psychological Association that said that about 50% of Americans are drinking to cope with stress right now, adults, um, which is very high, right? Um, and that's just the reality. I mean, people are not functioning at their best right now. Um, Nobody probably is. Um, everybody's uh, experiencing increased stress, some groups more than others, obviously, but um, that's, that's the new reality. And linking it back to my, my earlier comments about acting like uh, less like a corporation and more humanized, the corporate way of thinking about things is to go back to the way we were. You got to pump out as many things as possible. You got to um, produce as best of an output that you can in order to gather more prestige and more resources. And those are the things that drive our behavior. Um, and I think we really have to question that and recognize that more is not better always, and especially in the current situation and the context. Well, I, I uh, just want to echo uh, and add on to what uh, my colleagues here have said. I, I think that, uh, you know, th these past uh, one and a half years have been very challenging. And if I, I would say if, if there's a word that I would attach to the significance of um, these past uh, uh, years, it's community. Um, community in several ways community and that uh, we've seen that um, our sense of community has been significantly compromised um, as uh, you know we went into social uh, distancing mode and we saw the mental health uh, challenges um, uh, with with that disruption in our sense of community at the same time we saw communities come together um, through uh, to challenge uh, racial injustice and we saw the strength of um, of what communities and solidarity can do. And so, as Sam said, moving forward, I don't think that we can return to business as usual, not with the, not with the lessons that we've learned and the lessons that really have, you know, have been learned um, at cost of lives and, and cost of, of, um, of people's suffering. So we can't really ignore that. And so moving forward, I think that the, the, the lesson that, that, that I, uh, I'm trying to take and encourage uh, uh, others to, to reflect on is, what does it mean to be in community now? Now that um, we understand at a broader level that uh, there are these structural inequities that uh, prevent others from, um, from uh, being fully welcomed in and uh, impedes that sense of belonging. What is, what is, uh, developing relationship mean in a context where there may be some hybrid uh, uh, classes and learning. But in the end, that's what I think we need to, to really uh, keep in mind is, um, you know, humans need that sense of community. That's part of what defines resilience. And so how do we, how do we, um, how do we fulfill that need? Um, in the context of the lessons that we've learned um, over the, over these recent times. Mm. I love this as an ending point, Andrew. Um, we're at that point of the day that we're out of time. Um, I want to thank all of you for spending this last hour and a half with us. And um, we did have a poll for the audience also to participate in here. Uh, Charlotte's going to launch that poll, but it is, how would you like to stay committed to the mental health of API students? You can use, choose as many as you'd like. 
uh, learn more about the history of APIs, both in the US and your, your own institution, intentionally incorporate experiences of API students in your daily work, wherever that is, um, or actively engage in understanding how your institution's campus climate and or culture has or may continue to negatively impact your students. Um, so feel free to pay, uh, participate there. Um, we'll also have a short survey for you all to fill out that you'll also receive a, a link to tomorrow. It's like a four question survey for participants. Um, just about your awareness after, before and after having participated today. Thank you all for sharing so generously to our expert panel of your insights today. I know this conversation is so valuable to me given how it feels like a really unique space. It's really truly interdisciplinary um, and thoughtful. And I really appreciate that this, these spaces are only starting to take space, even though these conversations have been having uh, been had for a while. I appreciate how many um, different perspectives are in the room right now. Um, and thank you to all our participants for your all participating today. Um, also to the National Center for Institutional Diversity at the University of Michigan for their partnership in hosting this event. And thank you for the sponsorship from Harry Zink and from Morgan Stanley. Um, please stay tuned for our recommendations resource that's gonna come out in August. Um, and on behalf of the Steve Fund, we're excited to be continuing this conversation and see you all next time. Thank you so much. Thank you.